I tend to wander around quite a bit, so being tethered to this could be a little bit awkward for me, but I'll do my level best. I also wanted to share that I, like Linus before me, um, got a lot of very urgent emails saying, what are you doing? You come and you come at it. And I kept on going to my assistant and said, why, why am I getting all these emails? I'm set up, right? Oh, you're, you're good. Apparently, engineers tend to be really, really cautious and make sure that things go as planned. So ha thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully, you'll enjoy uh, some of what I'm about to present. Um, this has been an extraordinary week when you look at all the, the announcements of new products and innovations. I mean, that, that drone helicopter thing that carries two people around, who would have thought, right? Anyways, awesome week, but and I'm not going to try to be a Debbie Downer about the week, but the intent of, of what I'm going to share is sort of you know, what happens when all these devices are connected and how does that affect everything from privacy to security to, to, to you name it. So let's get this started. I think I have an hour, is that correct? Yes. An hour? All right. So um, it's been a hell of a year, all right? Just look at the, the last year and a half or so. And by the way, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of, of some of the, the challenges we face. In fact, one of the things I found really interesting about last year in particular is that um, we had the, the, the heartbleed incident, if you recall, back in, well, like 2014. And even though we always, we always have a lot of security events and activities going on, for some reason, when WannaCry hit, things just seem to go exponentially more broad. And I don't really understand the, the dynamics behind it, but we went from you know, just kind of doing the, the things that we do in the security space to responding to a WannaCry, responding to a Petya, responding to a crack, responding to an Equifax breach, a Reaper botnet, all these things that were just coming at a, at a pace we've never seen before. So the real point of this is that even though we've had some really high profile activities that, that defined our space in the past year and a half and affected the, the products that we in the security industry build to help protect uh, businesses and consumers, we think that, that it's even going to get more aggressive. We're going to see more types of exploits, more activity in the space that's going to make it even more interesting. And one of my biggest personal fears is that at what point does security become a gating factor towards the, the ultimate success of, of the Internet of Things and all things that we try to connect up? So I think that's the major takeaway from this particular slide is that the, 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 the velocity of activities is going to continue to increase. And just a little bit about my deck, I'm going to spend some time talking about present state sort of things. And then I actually pulled from our 2018 threat predictions report and sort of mapped some of what we've seen in, in the past couple of years against some of the predictions we're looking at for 2018 and beyond. But before I get into that, um, yeah, I'm not sure how many people here are actually in the security space, but it's always interesting to me when we look at the, the different actors that, that kind of do the bad deeds that we hear so much about. And probably the most popular one you hear about are nation states, because they tend to be the ones that, that really do the more high profile things. Think back to Sony, North Korea, and actually um, uh, North Korea has gotten attribution for the Mirai uh, ransomware attack. So we're seeing more and more instances where, where uh, states are building these, these cyber armies to go after everything from intellectual property, disrupt elections, to, to a whole host of activities that, that are really causing the security industry to take note. You know, not too far removed from, from the nation states are the hacktivists. You know, these are the, the organizations that assemble somewhat loosely at times to go after a cause, right? If they're upset about you know, some sort of law enforcement or some sort of banking industry thing, they will actually assemble teams to go after those, to do everything from denial of service attacks to publishing you know, sensitive information that, that, that wouldn't want to get on the public eye. So, so hacktivists tend to be somewhat loosely organized. And, and in a lot of cases, you'll see people that are member of, of nation state types of, of, 
of actors that'll participate in hacktivists, and they'll sometimes go off on their own. So there's, there's a loose coupling of, of alliances as we go through these different types of actors. The one that we, we, we pay a lot of attention to because it's, it's interesting to see how, how active they are, are the, the organized crime networks. You know, if you think behind some of the, 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 the ransomware attacks and, and other types of activities with the intention of actually um, monetizing from it, it's amazing just how profitable these organizations can be. And we obviously, we, we spend a lot of time as an industry working with law enforcement, be it you know, the FBI or Europol or other organizations to try to define, identify, especially these cyber criminal networks as they're very, very active in both you know, trying to extort money from, from potential um, you know, businesses or consumers, but they also spend time selling their wares on the dark web. So getting after the, the, the organized criminals and trying to disrupt their services and, and their capabilities in fact, uh, just uh, I think two weeks ago, our company was active in taking down the, it was the CryptoLocker um, ransomware group. So we, we continue to work with law enforcement to try to target these organizations to bring them to justice. But one of the big challenges, as you can imagine, is, is the barrier to entry here is pretty low, right? There is a time when committing a crime required that you be present. You know, you had to go to the bank, gun in hand, to try to, to, to rob the bank. Well, now you can do that in the comfort of your underwear from some dark corner of the world. You know, if it works, it's fine. If it doesn't work, that's okay too. So a lot of trial and error, not a lot of, of downside for getting into this type of, of, of career activity. But of all these groups, the one that I'm, I'm most interested in, I'm following most closely, are the gamers, right? There's a, there's a movement afoot and I don't even think that the, the, the gamers that are getting into this know what they're doing. In fact, there's, there's an interesting story. I met with a, the chief innovation officer of a company a couple months ago, and we were talking about a, a young man, a 15-year-old in the UK. You know, the cops show up at his parents' door. They knock on it. We're you're coming in to make an arrest. And they say, you're conducting, conducting cybercrime here. And they're like, we just got feature phones. We can't do cybercrime. And they'd say, the only computer we have in the house is our son's, but he's just gaming, so he's not doing anything. So they go up to the, the son's room. He's this 15-year-old boy, and they, and they, they, they of course, go into his room. And, and sure enough, he'd launched a, 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 an attack using a Trojan, a banking Trojan, and ended up stealing $2.3 million. The funny thing is, he actually spent that $2.3 million on gam online gambling. So A, he's a really bad gambler, and, and, and I don't know if, if this kid actually knew what he was doing was, was a crime, right? Because he went from, these are just monies flowing across the screen. If you look at the, the, the gamer mindset, it's all about going to the next level. So this could have been just gameplay in his mind. In fact, one of the things we find that of these these gamers in particular, they, they play these multiplayer games, and in a lot of cases, they're, they're, there's a sniper that keeps taking them out so they can't go to the next level. So they actually go online, spend like $7 to do this thing called booting, and they'll launch a denial of service attack, attack against the IP address that keeps on shooting them so we can go to the next level. So they kind of have this low barrier entry to go do a cyber criminal type of activity and you think, well, what's the harm? And let me just go try to experiment other things. And then the next thing you know, you're three clicks into the dark web, and you can do pretty much whatever you want. Everything from doing a, 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 a ransomware as a service type of attack or, or, or buy some open source or, or get some open source uh, malware that you can you know, weaponize and go, go use for an attack. So I just think this is the most interesting group because I genuinely believe that for the most part, they don't necessarily know that they're go getting into a very criminal type of activity. And there's, again, there's very little that stops them from going there. I wanted to spend just a couple of slides uh, explaining how we look at the, 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 the landscape. Our threat intelligence cloud, which is called the Global Threat Intelligence, has over a petabyte of data. That's basically 2,000 years of your favorite songs playing back to back. It is a ton of data. 
and if we obviously every moment we're collecting more and more data, that's that, that threat intelligence network, that, that billion, uh, that petabyte of data takes 44 billion queries every day. That's more than Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram combined. So the, the point here, and we get, I think, like 500,000 uh, queries every second. So the point here is that, that the amount of data that we're collecting that, that provides us um, the, the, the insights into what's going on in the space is pretty significant. And there's no sign of this slowing down. In fact, we, and I'll get to it in a little bit, how, how much we find. But what's important about our space and you've heard it all week. If, if you brought a business plan to CES and you talked about blockchain, AI, and the cloud, you probably got funded just by being able to pull those th three terms together. But one of the things that we're finding, especially in our space, is the use of, of artificial intelligence or machine learning. We have had to incorporate these type of capabilities into our products in order to better support our customers and our businesses that, that use us. But the bad guys are using it too. They have the same challenge we do, that they have, they're having to sift through a, a ton of data to try to find those, those nuggets that they can pull together in order to conduct a, a targeted attack, be it a, a smishing attack, you know, some sort of um, a whale fishing or some other type of technique that would go after high net worth individuals or, or phishing campaigns that could dupe companies into clicking on an email that supposedly came from their CEO to try to extract funds. So, this is going to be an interesting part of our of 2018 as we see the bad guys employing more and more artificial intelligence types of, of cyber attacks and then how the, the, the security ecosystem or the industry responds to help mitigate the, the impact of those types of attacks. When we look at the, the the various sectors in our space. You know, there was a time where everybody thought of, of malware as pretty much a, a thing for the PCs. And by and large, it's still probably the, by far the biggest segment. But if you look at growth in things like Mac and mobile, the point of this slide is to, to, to illuminate the fact that, that the bad guys are now trying to be more opportunistic. Right, they're trying to figure out where, where, are, where are the high net worth individuals, what are the devices they are using, and what sort of attacks can we use to target those individuals or businesses in order to do our, our malicious deeds. A particular segment of this is ransomware, and this is an area that our space in particular have been, being, have been paying very close attention to over the past couple of years. It actually came out, um, I think, about 10 or 12 years ago and then went dormant. And then with the introduction of anonymous payments vis-a-vis -vis the, the Bitcoins of the world and stuff like that, it came back with a, with a tear these past couple of years. But in this last year alone, we saw about 59% growth in ransomware. And the ransomware authors are getting really, really good at trying a bunch of different techniques to, to, to have a success with their, with their different wares. You know, for example, we went from the, the original um, type of ransomware that was out there really just focused on certain files on a PC and locked those up and then you had to pay a ransom to, to, to get those unlocked. Now we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis Petya, or not Petya, um, disk encryption, full disk encryption that will lock up the entire drive and cause d disk wipes um, as, as a form of the ransom. We're also, Petya also introduced the idea of variable payment, right, where if you don't either pay a certain amount in a certain amount of time or if you, you don't act in another way, we will A, either start deleting certain files, or B, will change that ransom to, 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 a, to a higher amount. So they're getting more and more creative on how they actually execute the ransom to try to get the, the, uh, the target to go ahead and to, to bend to their will. Um, we're also seeing ransomware that's getting really smart about sandboxing. They're using uh, obfuscation techniques and other forms to, to hide itself so if it looks like it's going into a sandbox environment and won't execute, it'll wait till it finds something that's not sandbox so it can actually do the dirty deeds. We talked about it a couple of minutes ago, ransomware as a service. For those poor cyber criminals, the, the, the kids who are getting into it and don't really understand how to create their own ransomware attack, they can go online and, and get one as a service. And we think we're gonna see a lot more of this in, in, in this year 
especially. And one other one that I think is really important that, that, that is going to be interesting to see what happens over the course of a couple of, of years is website encryption. If you're, a, most companies today use commerce as, as a part of their, their web presence. We're now seeing ransomware, which, which will tie up key parts of that, that web presence so you can no longer conduct transactions until you pay a ransom. When you start holding the keys to your castle and your ability to, to conduct business, it, it gets people's attention. In fact, uh, I think it was two years ago when I was in California, there was a surf shop that, that uh, had a ransomware attack. He lost 10 years of data. He didn't have any backup and basically the entire business was lost because he, he, he didn't pay the ransom. They just totally crippled his machines and he basically lost 10 years of customer data. So now I'm going to cascade into one of our predictions. Um, because industry is getting better at being able to detect ransomware and we're also assembling to, to help target ransomware authors. In fact, uh, McAfee has partnered with other industry um, companies to, to bring out the No More Ransom Initiative, where we're basically publishing keys to certain strains of ransomware that are freely available. So the industry is getting better at combating ransomware, so we're going to see them pivot to new targets. They're going to go away from the traditional you know, PCs and mobile phones that we've seen historically, and they're going to start going to other attack surfaces. They're going to start looking at high net worth individuals. This is where using the artificial intelligence to understand how to best target those individuals is going to come in handy for the, for the bad guys. But they're also going to be doing it more and more connected devices. In fact, this past year, one of the things our labs organization did is they went out and bought a, a commercial third party um, infotainment system that you can buy anywhere. And we were able, using the CAN bus, uh, um, um, the CAN bus technology or architecture, actually install ransomware on that infotainment system. So this is happening today, and what we think is going to happen as as the the ransomware authors get even better and better, they're going to look at things like the cars and especially driverless cars. Imagine a day when you wake up and you walk out there and your car starts, but it's not going to move an inch until you pay a ransom. When you saw what happened with Jeep a couple years ago using a cell connection, they were able, they were able to go in and take complete control of that vehicle, including the, the braking, acceleration, steering, things like that. We're, we're going to see similar techniques where they're going to use ransomware as the means to, to infect a vehicle and demand a ransom before that car can, can, can move. We're also going to see um, ransomware applied to cyber, sab cyber sabotage along the lines of what we saw in WannaCry and NonPetya. What, what made WannaCry and NonPetya so interesting to the space is it redefined the playbook for the bad guys. Right? It used to be the, these attacks were very targeted and now they're just trying to do whatever they can to do it in mass. So now the playbook has been rewritten for the bad guys to conduct cyber attacks using ransomware to try to get this out there in mass. And we think that this is going to be a year where they really double click on going after these types of, of, of attack techniques because of the success and the media attention that WannaCry and NonPetya enjoyed. So IoT, this is why we're here, right? Or one of the reasons we're here. Um, yeah, you know, there's really two main things that we're looking at when it comes to the IoT threat landscape. One is the fact that, that yeah, most networks have had some sort of, some sort of attack al already. Um, the the ability for these um, either denial of service or other capabilities is growing in scale, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and we think by 2020, some 10% of all attacks will be targeting IoT, will be 10% uh, of all cyber attacks will be targeting connected things as the point of entry. And once they get it, be it a business or household, and get on that one device, that's when they start moving laterally across the organization to try to get on, on more higher worth assets in the organization to do more nefarious things. The, the dichotomy we, we face in our industry is the fact that 
the device manufacturers are really spending no meaningful time thinking about security controls as you build these devices. So they're, they're hoping that they're trying to solve for time to market and convenience. They're trying to get that connected thing in the, the, the hands of users as quickly as possible and foregoing any meaningful security controls. The, the, the flip of that are the consumers and organizations that use these devices are spending no time trying to figure out how we lock them down. So you, you've got this, this quagmire that, that's, that's coming our way that's putting these connected devices in market, in mass, that are going to be extremely attractive for the bad guys. And I want to talk about two that, that got a little bit of attention over the past year or so, Mirai and Reaper. Two different malware, very, very different types of techniques. Mirai, if you recall, uh, used a, a, a brute force type of attack, username, passwords, because again, the devices are going into these organizations, into these homes, without any change to the username, password. And once they would try to, to access the device, they'd download the, the, uh, the malware and then have it be stayed, waiting in state until the, the, the botnet was executed. Um, we've since seen Mirai. A couple things have happened. Um, because the law enforcement was getting ready to, to arrest the authors of Mirai, uh, they actually made Mirai available available as open source code. So now we're seeing a bunch of different variants of Mirai show up around the world. And it's also being repurposed to do things beyond just um, launching a denial of service tech or being part of a botnet. They're also being used for, for Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining, as well as doing other types of, of, of um, cross-server type of attacks. So that's actively going on in one place. This past year, Reaper was introduced. And there's, again, there's varying reports, but, but Reaper uses a different type of technique for, for installing itself. Instead of trying to do brute force, username, pastor type of attack, Reaper actually looks at, I think, nine different known vulnerabilities in connected things. As, as we said, the device manufacturers aren't really spending any time on security, so they're, they're trying for some known vulnerabilities. If they find a known vulnerability, they'll infect it. But what, what makes Reaper so interesting is Reaper, once it's infected in one device, it'll infect every device that's connected to in an organization. And it'll do, do so very rapidly. There's one estimate that thinks there's, there's over a thousand devices that are, I'm sorry, over a million devices that are part of the Reaper botnet right now. And they s expect that if it continues on its current course and trajectory, it could get enough capacity to take down the entire internet. Again, two different strains of, of malware specifically targeting connected things. Um, and in fact, one of, the, one of the most interesting stories I, I heard last year was uh, there was a group, I think, in, in Germany someplace where uh, a, a, a university had f flew a drone. Remember that drone we talked about when we kicked it off? The, the, anyways, a regular drone next to a building did a direct injection of malware into the first connected thing it could find. Next thing you know, the entire floor in this building was infected with malware. So the ability for the bad guys to get creative in actually infecting these connected things is getting pretty interesting out there right now. So last year, um, yeah, last CES, I sat down. I forgot with one of the journalists said, yeah, we, got, we put a toaster in our lab. And uh, it was pretty much infected within 20 seconds. So we thought, hey, let's, uh, let us try that. So we actually went out, got a commercial DVR, brought it into our lab, fired it up, and weighed it. Within 64 seconds, it was crawled, authenticated to. I actually had to try three or four different passwords, still got the right combination. And the, the Mirai malware was, install, was installed within 64 seconds. Now imagine that in a world today where we're connecting roughly 4,800 devices every minute of every day. So every time one of those devices lights up, if you've not done anything to try to, to, to protect that device, chances are, unless it's sitting behind a, a a Wi-Fi with a pretty secure password is going to get infected. Um, and IDC predicts that by 2025, we'll be connecting roughly 152,000 devices every minute of every day. 4,800 a day, 152,000 every minute of every day in a couple of years. The, the, the rapid expansion of that attack surface combined with the, the failure for industry or the manufactures the devices to do anything meaningful about security, coupled with the, the lack of awareness and, and, 
and lack of any meaningful time spent in securing those devices, it's going to make our, our life in cybersecurity very interesting over the next couple of years. So what's one of the predictions we had tied to this? Um, beyond just the ability for these devices to get infected in mass, we actually think that uh, connected home devices will, will surrender uh, privacy. And we're seeing that happen already. Um, marketers today, it's funny, one of the things when I'm out having a, a different, I, there's, a, there's another tra talk track I have around privacy and some of the challenges there, but one of the things we, we often talk about is that marketers just like collecting information, right? And I keep on trying to express to them the importance of only collecting the information you need to deliver your good or service. If you want, if you think, you know, getting, let's get their date of birth, let's get all this other information, and somehow that's going to be good for you, you're wrong. And what's going to happen if you can co to continue to collect that information and, and the bad actors know it's available, it's going to be used against you in a big way and you're going to be a headline someday that you just don't want to see. So we're going to see the, the, the companies continue to, to try to extract more and more private information from the consumers that use those devices. And, and how many people here ever read a EULA or a privacy agreement? Show, I'm really, show of hands. How many of you ever spend the time to read that or do you just click agree? Some people actually, oh shit, I gotta scroll all the way down to the bottom before I can hit the agree. Nobody reads them. And by the way, the most common narrative in every single one of these that the, the company puts in there is we have the right to change this at any time. So you just basically said, I accept whatever you're gonna do, not only today, but in the future. Think about that. Nobody reads these. Um, and it makes it really attractive for corporations to try to mine this because data is the new currency. The more data that we're able to collect, the, the better we're able to understand the behaviors of consumers and businesses, the more able we're able to provide the, the right message at the right time for that good or service at that point of presence when that consumer or that business best needs it, that's going to define success for companies you know, for the future. Unfortunately, they're going to do that at the expense of your privacy. Now, there have been some activities that you probably heard about that, that are really targeting, foc focusing on, on privacy, especially in, in Europe. But this is going to be an ongoing struggle for our industry where, where these organizations are going to collect way too much information. You know, it's going to get into the wrong hands and, and, and bad things are going to happen. Because if we go back to the earlier statement where the bad guy is using artificial intelligence, they're basically assimilating tons and tons of information. In fact, um, I think it was the year before last, we, we, we took down a botnet. I want to say it was in the Netherlands. I don't recall the location, but uh, as part of our takedown, we went in with law enforcement and got access to some of the servers. And we actually, just as an as a, a academic function, we actually found one of the people who was uh, a target of this organization. And so uh, we went to his home, with, obviously with law enforcement, and we said, hey, we're with McAfee, we, we, here's law enforcement, we took down the spot net, and here's the information we found about you. And it was pages of information. Mother's maiden name, date of birth, every single username, password he had was on this, this form we got off the server. And the question he asked us was, in a word, humbling. This is what do I do? And that's the rub. There's nothing you can do. Once it's out there in mass, once these, these bad actors have got the the ability to, to, to synthesize its information and draw from it those, those bits that they need to either conduct identity fraud, identity theft, otherwise target you in, in some sort of phishing, a, a, a spear phishing attack or something like that, it's, it's, it's out there. And there's enough information. In fact, and this is a bit of a, of a, of a tangent, but Equifax, everybody heard about Equifax, right? Um, who didn't hear about Equifax, by the way? I'm glad nobody raised their hand. Anyway, so, you know, Equifax happened, and, and being in the security industry, I tend to be more, um, I spend a lot of time monitoring my credit, my bank accounts. I'm, I'm really in tune to what's going on. I use a, a, an identity monitoring service. Uh, but I went up to see my mom, right? She's on a fixed income. She's retired now. I said, hey, mom, did you hear about Equifax? Yeah, I heard about it. Ah, oh, it's too bad. Yeah, oh, really bad. I said, mom, what, did, what have you done about it? I haven't done anything. Are you kidding? You know, she, she hadn't gone to any of the credit bureaus, hadn't frozen her credit, hadn't even tried to figure out that she's the type of person 
that will be the biggest victim of, of this massive collection of information that are at the fingertips now of the bad guys. There's a time when, recall, I think five years ago now, where, where credit cards were all the thing that the bad guys were going after. There was the Target, the Home Depot, you name a retailer, almost everybody got, everybody got breached. But then what happened is the credit card companies got really, really good at detecting fraud. So the bad guys shift that focus, going back to the artificial intelligence. And now if you, if you closely follow what's happened over the past couple of years, they've shifted their focus to things like healthcare companies, insurance companies, and companies like that because of the wealth and depth of information you have on consumers vis-a-vis -vis the Equifax. So what the bad guys are doing is they're taking this information from all these different sources and they're figuring out at what point can I go use this information to do something bad. You know, insurance fraud is probably the, the biggest challenge we're going to face in the next several years because it's typical between HIPAA privacy type of concerns and the fact that we typically use multiple service providers and insurance companies, the ability for, the, for these different organizations to get all their act together by the time you've done the insurance fraud, you've already had the fraudulent activity take place and moved on. Yeah, this is, this is our, again, our prediction for 2018 is that, that corporations will be willing to actually break known laws in order to continue to collect this information because they figure the fine is going to be far less than the value extracted from the data. Um, this week, I recall, I think it was VTech, which is a, a company that makes games for kids. Uh, last year, maybe two years ago, they were, they had this massive breach, find out they were collecting a lot of information they shouldn't have, shouldn't have been collecting. Um, and they basically got fined, I want to say $650,000. And in fact, this past year, somebody was challenging them on, well, are you guys going to change your, your privacy and the data you collect? Now we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. Why would they stop? You know, they're making millions and millions of dollars off these, these, the information these toys are collecting. They're getting fined $650,000. There's no big impediment or big deterrent for them to continue to do that type of behavior. And the last prediction that, that, that I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about, because I think it, um, it, it bears mentioning, is the importance of, of the targeting of children. You know, go any place today. Go to the mall, go to the theater, go any place. Every single child you see typically has some sort of device for them. You know, they're playing games, they're, they're doing whatever they do, and, and corporations today are, are really going to start mining that information for long-term effects. Think about our, your own buying preferences, right? When you go out to buy a, a pair of sneakers, do you buy Nike, do you buy Puma, do you buy, there's, there's a, those companies spend an extraordinary amount of time typically doing what we call above-the-line marketing in order to, to get your behavior or get your, your brand of, uh, affiliation as early as possible and, and then have that stay with you f through your life because that's where they get real value from it. We think that, that the, the amount of time that kids are spending on devices, the behaviors that they're, and the things they're doing on devices is going to be keenly interesting to not only the bad guys but corporations because they want to understand their behaviors and their activities so they can mine that data and, and build a long-lasting relationship with the child. And we think that that's probably not a good way to go about it because you're exposing somebody who doesn't have the, 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 the wherewithal or the, the understanding of exactly what that information that they're giving up means. Here's the thing, as we talked about before, that data never ever goes away. It's a forever thing. So the data that these companies are collecting today on children is something that they'll be able to, to, to mine and harvest for years and years and years, and it's gonna be all but impossible for, for children to, of today, or even ourselves for that matter, to go actually get our hands around our, our private or personal information to pull it back. The fix for this is companies that, that understand that, that this behavior can take place and the willingness for them to be um, forward-looking and engaging with the parents 
and so the parents understand what types of what types of apps the kids are using, the type of information that's being collected by those apps, and their their ability to make sure that the the use of the information from the apps is being used for something that's not going to be done at the detriment of the child or some sort of long have some sort of long term impact to the child. And the last thing I want to talk about today is crack. I, I, I probably sure most of you have heard about Meltdown Inspector. That's what a way to start 2018. But a little, uh, I think about three months ago now, maybe four months ago, crack came out. And crack was a, a vulnerability in the encryption of, wi of every Wi Fi connected device. So everything that connects over Wi Fi. Would have been vulnerable to the crack. Um, would have been vulnerable have the crack vulnerability. And what makes this really interesting is is the type of data you could serve up is you could basically set it up so you could sniff off every information that was going over any channel that that, that was using WPA2. And thankfully, as an industry, we got in front of this, and I believe that most devices have been patched, and most operating systems have been updated, but. The, the fear that we have is you have some of these older devices that have been unpatched, and if, if the bad actors can figure out how to effectively use that as an attack surface, they'll be able to collect tons of information. Go back, if you recall earlier, we talked about Heartbleed. Heartbleed, um, we, we, we heard about it, we, we, uh, we galvanized around it, we made sure that, that we, we put all the fixes in places in industry that we should. But even so, about two or three months after the Heartbleed vulnerability was announced, which was a vulnerability in SSL, we started seeing attacks in the wild. I would expect probably over the course of the next couple of months, we're going to see attacks in the wild that are going to be targeting the, the cracked vulnerability because we're just now getting to the point where the bad guys know how to exploit it, and we'll see this happening probably over the course of the next couple of months. And that's all I had. Any questions? I, I guess it's fair to say that uh, most of the PCs and, and the operating systems that are out there were originally designed, certainly back in the legacy sense, without really real concerns about security. And we, we seem to be fighting a, a continuing battle of trying to layer on different levels of you know, hardware devices and firewalls and software and this sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> is is there, in, in your view, a a, uh, a radical change or need in the the basic architecture? Uh, if we were, or let me ask another way: If we were starting kind of greenfields and thinking about some of the security issues, what what would these operating systems and hardware look like? And is there some way to migrate where we are today towards something that's a lot more robust so we're not constantly fighting one battle after the other? Yeah, you know, we always talk about the, 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 the need for a silver bullet to security. And, and certainly there's all sorts of architectural changes we can make to, to operating systems, um, you know, compute architectures and things like that to make them more sturdy, more, more, uh, more secure as we know it today. But anything we do today, you know, who knows what's going to happen three to five years. So I, my fear is that we're always, one of the, the most interesting technologies we're going to see um, in 2020 is going to be 5G as a good example. Right, when you talk about the, the, the security architecture for 5G, it looks extremely rich and robust. But what's in, inevitably going to happen is when it actually gets out there and, and the bad guys start understanding, you know, how the protocols work, how everything connects, how, you know, the systems work and, and ways that they can manipulate it, they're going to manipulate it. So I, I, I would love to say that there's something we could do at, at the operating system level, the chip level, the, the compute architect level. But I think anything we do would just be, you know, it would fix us at this moment in time. And maybe we would see a dip in, in the overall activity that, that, that defines our space today, but I think it would be just a dip. And then we'd see some sort of way that they could get around it and then continue to move on. By the way, the, it, even if we build the most, the best mousetrap in the world, it, it's still it's going to come down to people, right? People are going to do stupid things. They're going to click on a phishing email. They're going to let, they're going to open the door and say, come on in and, and get access to the, the information you want. So even if we came up with, with the, the, the best way to, to, to lock this stuff down, 
ultimately the people that interact with these systems are where things go terribly wrong. <clears throat> Related to the DVR exploit, was uh, that device connected directly to the internet with a global routable IP? Or was it behind a NAT device? It, it, was, it, was, it, it was exposed externally, and okay. by, by design, right? You, if you put it behind a firewall, put it behind a, a, another layer of, of protection, it wouldn't have got, but the thing of it is we were trying to emulate things like cameras and other things that would, would typically have to have a, 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 a public-facing IP address. Right. So you're right. It, it, the likelihood of that happening in a home that, that was using you know, some sort of um, encrypted uh, Wi-Fi type of connection is not very high. So the next question it was a honeypot type of situation. I should have I should have said that. Okay. Okay. So the next question is similar. Um, it involves IPv6. With mm -hmm. most modern operating systems, are preferring IPv6 over IPv4. Mm -hmm. And IPv6 will, if possible, give that device a globally unique IP address. So in essence, that device now is exposed to the internet. Can you comment on the impact of that? Yeah. You know, IPv6 was was going to be the next holy grail, right? We'd run out of, of, of IP sockets, and we had to come up with an alternative. And, and when, you, when they were originally authoring and building the IPv6, they said, this is not only going to give us you know, uh, unlimited connectivity, but it's going to allow us to do things we couldn't do with IPv4. And I think you, you, you pointed to something that goes back to the previous, not your previous question, but the question before. Is let's say that, that, that IPv6 ends up being this ability to open up IP addresses, and then people can directly target those. Um, bad things are going to continue to happen, even if you have a more secure operating system, a more secure compute architecture. If that IP is exposed and accessible, then yeah, we think that, that it's going to allow for bad things to happen, potentially. Another question back here? Yep. I want to follow up on that gentleman's question and just add a couple of other flavors of things that are occurring that uh, maybe you can comment on. So two of them. One of them is... Um, on the network side, uh, you know, blockchain will become part of the computing environment at some point. We'll fix the latency, we'll fix the power issues, you know, it'll be bi-directional so that devices can, can talk bi-directionally. So assume we do all that. I, I think that that has, you know, some flavor of, uh, of protection to it. Maybe you can comment on it. And the other one is in hardware, there's a lot of things going on where you can enable, uh, you know, if you want to call it a kill switch, where the user or you can enable a service to actually say, hey, You've been, you've been, you're, you're in the process of being corrupted. I'm just going to take your device offline. Sure. So maybe you can talk about those kind of aspects. Yeah, I actually love the idea of. In fact, um, we have a new product which which goes because we feel that the the most vulnerable spot now is the home. You know, people are bringing in all these devices and and they, they're not doing anything about security, and so we've actually built a, a software kill switch. It basically says if if you know, if your device looks like it's gone rogue, it's, it's either got some, some sort of infection or it's started chatting it up with a different server, uh, we will inform you and, and the option is to just take it offline. And then, you know, we obviously, at that point, if it has been infected, you, you'd want to you know, reach out to the manufacturer to reflash the firmware or something like that. But I, yeah, we think that that, again, those, there's things that we need to start doing as industry to help in, in these types of scenarios. And you're know, going to a, a model where you have almost an always-on security environment where as devices come on and as devices do things that, that seem to be out of character for that device, you know, the, the, the consumer has very little involvement other than the, the certainty that it's doing something it shouldn't and, and they should act on it. But it's, it's one of those, so I, I like that idea, let's put it like that. And we going back to blockchain, I think there's, there's a lot of interest, I think, in using blockchain to build more secure environments. But I think a lot of people are putting blockchain up as this, this holy grail sort of um, capability, which I don't, I don't think is gonna happen. Like every other thing that, that seems to be that holy grail has this, this ability not to have compromise as we've seen in other environments or scenarios, all of a sudden we realize, oh, something you know, can be done to manipulate it and, and then we, we, we've got a, yet another compromised environment. So I, I, my, I am optimistic about blockchain. I think it's going to help in, in a lot of different ways. I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be, um, again, the holy grail that, that's going to solve all of, our, all of our sins, for lack of a better word. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, I just have a very simple question. Uh, Guys, you're not giving me simple questions. Okay. Just putting that out there. 
Do you have a cooperation and coordination with other companies that they are in the same field and uh, antivirus, cybersecurity, or you are working in silos? We absolutely work with, uh, what's it called, the, we just started a consortium at RSA this last year. Every major vendor's in it. I forgot the name of it. I apologize for that. Um, we are working very actively with, um, you know, law enforcement. Obviously, there, there's a lot of, of needs and, and when it comes to finding the, the cyber criminal networks and bringing them to justice. But yeah, this has to have, when I talk about that, our global threat intelligence, you know, we share that data. You know, we share it with, with our competitors, we share it with others, because we're, we all have to get better, right? The, the, the more we share, the more open we are, uh, the, the better we're going to be able to protect those people that need um, security. But it's, it's, there's always a, 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 a reluctance. I remember, what was it? It was uh, WannaCry. WannaCry was, when WannaCry happened, um, almost all the security vendors went out and tried to, to, to build the decryption key, right? And to make it freely available, um, and so when we were meeting with media, um, I, I was well, obviously I had to talk to our PR people, legal, and things like that as we you know, structure our response. And one of our uh, parts of our organization said, "Well, why would we share the fact that we're trying to build a, a, a decryption key? Then everybody's going to want to build one, take credit for it." I said, "Well, how is that a bad thing?" If, if one of our competitors builds a key and provided they make it freely available, we should be willing to, to promote that and say, hey, listen, this you know, vendor XYZ, they beat us to the, to, the, to the end, but they got a decryption key, we should point everybody to it so everybody is safe. So it's, there's a lot of sharing of, of threat intelligence information across the security ecosystem, across the, the, the broader industry. Um, I, I don't think it's quite where it needs to be, and we need to continue to strive to get better there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, I have a quick question. Uh, so if I compare, let's say, software-based security solution versus hardware-based security solution, what is your opinion? Which one is better? Uh, software versus hardware? Based security solution. Yeah. Software always allows for you can continue to improve, right? Some of the challenges with hardware, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a baked in deal. So the hardware in, in a short term basis can give you a, 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 the, a more secure environment, but it's short lived. I mean, it's only as long as that hardware is still relevant. You know, software gives you a little bit more flexibility and in, in, in ability to innovate as the, the attack surface, the, the, the threats, the, all these things change, which they will. So I, I, but both ideally are, 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 are constantly being innovated on. I just think that it, it depends on the use case, it depends on the environment. There are some places where, for example, if you're doing industrial control type of capabilities, I want to make sure that, that is, 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 has, there's as much security in that hardware as you can possibly bake in, because then you're talking about lives being at stake. So uh, I'm going to take advantage of holding the microphone to make this the last question and get us to the 1.30 sessions on time uh, and uh, give Gary a chance to get a drink of water and rest. But uh, here, here's, here's my question. It starts a little story. Uh, I have a home PABX. It's a Linux box. It runs a asterisk open source software, and all my phones kind of go through that. Um, I thought I had it secured fairly well. It's behind a firewall. Uh, the control dashboard has got its own password, this sort of thing. What I didn't realize was uh, there's a Telnet interface to it that allows you to do low-level kinds of configurations. It has its own password. Yeah. Never knew it existed, nor did I block the port. Uh, so end of the long story is, is that uh, within about a couple hours of getting it up, somebody completely rewrote the software and started making phone calls all around the world through my lines. Uh, I should know better, uh, but as these consumer appliances made from different manufacturers and different things start getting out there, the ability to configure them and set them up in a, in a way where the average consumer can deal with it seems to me to be a, a problem that's not being solved. Is, is there an opportunity for some sort of service bureau that can 
go in either externally or internally and audit yeah. uh, That's some a great of these question. systems? We, and, we, we and actually, deal. this product I, not, I talked about a little bit ago, it's like that actually will scan your entire home environment and I'll say, here's the, the devices we found. Oh, by the way, here are some of the, the, the vulnerabilities we found. Here's Here's a light bulb that has using default username and password. Here's a, 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 an open port on this other device, and it won't it won't configure it for you, but at least it'll go as far as say, hey, listen, this this could be a risk for you, and you're shutting down that port or changing your username and password on that light bulb is going to go a long ways to making sure these devices are are compromised. But I, I I don't know. You know, one of the things we talk about that I hope gets a little bit of a critical mass is that everybody's familiar with Energy Star, right? That basically you, you, you buy your appliances and you can save so much energy. We're trying to get some critical mass around doing something similar for connected things. Where when you go out to, to your Best Buy or Amazon where you're gonna buy your stuff, you see device A and device B, both light bulbs. This has got some sort of uh, security rating that says this has got these controls, these capabilities, so it makes it more secure than this other bulb. All things being equal, I think a more informed consumer is going to buy that light bulb this because we've done a lot of research. Consumers don't want to be involved with something bad. You know, if they know that their devices are being used for botnet or doing other bad activities, they don't want to be involved. So if, they, if you have the means to say, hey, device, this device is is going to be at least some level more secure than this other device, which doesn't have an, a like serv, uh, a like certification, that would be one way to hopefully keep you know consumers informed on this is an important thing but also allow them to take more informed decisions on what to buy versus uh, when they're doing comparison shopping.